Well, without further ado, please let's welcome to the stage the star of the film, Simon Pegg, and the director, Peter Chelsom. Come on, guys. Welcome. Take a seat, Grandma. Hello. Welcome. Congratulations, guys. I've been lucky enough to see the film. Uplifting, fun, funny. Good stuff. Um, for the people that just have seen the trailer and not the actual film, tell us a little bit more about Hector and why he is searching for happiness. Uh, well, he is a psychiatrist who, on a daily basis, comes in contact with people who have problems uh, which aren't necessarily really problems. I think this is something which kind of frustrates him. There are people that are complaining about things that have no real, aren't a threat to their lives or are just sort of mundane, modern, affluent problems. And I think. Also himself, he's feeling a certain amount of suspicion that there's more to life than what he has. He's very comfortable and satisfied. His life is very tidy and it just, for some reason, he's not happy. And so he decides that, you know, under the kind of guise of research to go off and discover what it is. But what he really wants to find out is that if he can be happy, you know. And Peter, what appealed to you? Because it's a book originally, isn't it? What appealed to you about this story? You know, it's a fable and for me, um, it meant coming back to Britain and making films where I started, and you're all way too young to remember the films I used to make, like Hear My Song and Funny Bones, maybe. Woo! Yeah, there you go. Yeah, my one audience. But it was just, it was just great to be back in that kind of liberated place where I was allowed to make a film the way I wanted to make it. Um, and it's a film about happiness, and I thought that was a very uh, uh, timely theme. It's a good time to make a film about happiness, you know. And there was a fair bit of travel involved, obviously, in making this. Um, can you remember how many places you went to, how many planes you got on? I, I know I did 128,000 air miles last year, um, and it's not on a particular card. I just worked that out, that, how far we traveled. And we were on planes. We shot a lot on planes as well. So I was in a lot of planes that just weren't in the air. For two days, we were on a plane shooting, weren't we, in South Africa? It was a nightmare. <laughs> that must feel very weird, a <laughs> stationary plane. It is really, really yeah. weird. It was kind of, uh, it's quite claustrophobic and warm. And um, so, yeah, we I spent a lot of time on planes. But it was an amazing, I mean, we, it felt like we made five movies, wasn't it? Kind of. Yeah, I think the, the, the only way I could get my head around it and contain it was think of it as five different movies. But we actually, in the end, shot in Los Angeles, Vancouver, London, Johannesburg, outside Johannesburg, Shanghai, mountains of, sh of, of China. Bavaria, Austria, and Nepal, and I, it, and India, right? Ladakh is that in India or Nep Nepal? Is that not in? Is that Nepal? Oh, I sound like a really ignorant pig. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. You don't know where you went. <laughs> you, you, know, you know less I than I do. Know, I don't know geography. I don't know geography. <laughs> well, um, Hector is perhaps not such a competent traveller as you. Shall we have a look at a clip of him packing? Yes. Yes. That is, that is basically me packing. That's you packing, really? Is that, that based and, on your and own And that lady there is my wife, and she'll tell you that's exactly what it's like when I go anywhere. <laughs> Down to the shops, it's like that. Really? So this is based on you more than the book? Well, I have fed a bit <laughs> of myself into it, yes. Really? That's interesting. So did you consult a great deal on set in terms of, you know, to Simon, this is how I am, or Hector is? <laughs> Well, no, there were, there were times when Simon would say to me, you're going to like this one, and he'd do a take, and I'd go, yeah, that was great, and he went, it was you. <laughs> I'd go, okay, bye. Which was very nice, but it, it wasn't all the time, but he did. Because the film is very um, funny as well as kind of inspiring, isn't it? I mean, what, what sort of choices did you have to make in terms of that balance, you know, when it was to be outrageously funny? Because obviously some of your humour is quite physical. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a real pleasure to be directed by Peter because he knew precisely how to pitch the movie so at times he would say less Simon sometimes he'd say more Simon and and you know and it was it was lovely to be able to 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 know exactly what he wanted and what was required it's, it's sometimes when you're an actor and you work with a director who doesn't really direct you it can be incredibly frustrating because you're never sure if you're doing what's needed of you I'm I like to be directed and Peter was was fabulous for just sort of like gauging my performance so sometimes I could be very restrained sometimes I'd be like Buster Keaton you know it was kind of a, a nice uh, a variation of, of moods and techniques along the way I think sounds like you had a good working relationship one of the best, yeah. I mean, I think, I think a lot of the actors arrived in the mode of I'm in a comedy. And I, my thing is usually trust that the situations are bizarre and absurd enough. Just play the truth and it will work just as well. But Simon just slipped right in there into that mode very, very quickly. And yes, there were days when I would say, here's my note. More Simon, more Simon, more Simon. Because then when he <laughs> plays, it comes alive, you know. So it, it's yeah. very, very silly in places as well as 
yeah rather sad and tragic and dark and other places yeah exactly talking of which i mean the, the the travels we have another nice clip now showing some of those sort of happy experiences that hector has on his travels let's take a look you see yeah do you have happy memories of filming that one yeah that was an amazing part of uh of just outside johannesburg it was a community that and they didn't there wasn't any electricity or uh water there or anything was there and um i think we 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 ended up leaving a bunch of stuff there just because it felt churlish to take it away but the people that were there and were cooperating with us filming were extraordinarily accommodating and um it's it's a weird thing and 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 it kind of led to partly or a lot of my understanding of what happiness is in in some respects particularly in johannesburg and soweto and around there was that we'd be in places that were deeply, you know, sort of depressed uh, economically, but you'd see more smiles there, a, more, a, a slightly clearer understanding of what happiness was compared to the more affluent areas of the city where there were a lot of very tense white people in sort of like uh, gated communities and stuff. It was, it was a strange kind of demonstration of how when your life is, is, is clearer in terms of survival, you tend to be aware of what happiness is. It doesn't mean you're happier all the time, but it means that you have a clearer idea of what it means to be happy because you also know what it means to be, uh, you know, facing death or extremely poor. And there's something to be said for, you know, a society which has so much choice and so much wealth. People tend to be less happy in a weird kind of way. I'm not advocating, like, advocating poverty or, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but it's, it's strange that when you start to remove choice from people's lives, they have a clearer idea of, of what's happy and what's not because the boundaries are far more drawn, you know? Yeah, and that, that's very well put, I think. I mean, did it make you both think a great deal about the nature of happiness and what happiness is making this? Yeah, actually, it was in the writing process that my co-writer and I felt very changed by, by doing the story. I remember my co-writer, she's called Tinker, and any epiphanic moment she would just leap up from the desk and say, oh, God, that's it. Now I've got to marry Cameron, her boyfriend. You know, it's like she, it, because I think that, I think that we, it, it makes you kind of focus, you know, and I, yeah. Christopher Plummer in the movie says, everything in this world is going up except happiness. And it's true. And I think we live in a world where we are, it, it, it suits, <laughs> it suits commerce that we are always lacking in something. Do you know what I mean? It's like credit and advertising has made very sure, he says from an Apple Mac store, <laughs> please go buy everything, it's fine. <laughs> but it's true, it's like, it, you know, it, it, it's true, we are in a constant state of lacking and it's, uh, it's not helping. You mentioned Christopher Plummer just then, this has an amazing cast, a broadcast. Yes. Um, can I quickly run some names past you and give me a little word about each one? Or, or sure. he'll just, do them, I'll do the right voice then. and he'll do the body. Okay, br okay. brilliant. Uh, Rosamund Pike? Do a noise. Do a noise. <laughs> oh, Roz. I love Roz. I, we worked together on The World's End, and so uh, we, we, we got a, a relationship there. We're, we're really good friends, and it, it helped us to play Hector and Clara in a way that was very comfortable and, 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 and almost get across that idea of them being, you know, blissfully happy because they're at this state of ease, you yeah. know, which is actually the problem with their relationship in a weird way. But for me and Roz, it was easy to play that. She's awesome. Very, very good actress. I can't wait for you guys to see her in Gone Girl, which she just, uh, which she just shot, which is going to be amazing. David Fincher. And she's wonderful in this as well. I can't wait for that. Uh, Tony Collette. Again, someone I, I hadn't really met. I've met Tony once. And I think when I met her, I said, you're terrible, Muriel. I think that was what I said when I met her, you, <laughs> you know, like a, like a fan, you know. And then we, we, we were working together on this. And within a day, we were like, you know, besties and 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 she's just a oh, she's a great laugh isn't she tony she's brilliant. tony tony collette plays his character's ex-girlfriend uh, and he's put that ex-girlfriend on, on a pedestal for years and years and years and what we wanted to happen when we wrote it is that that character gives his character a real bollocking at the end of the movie and she does and she really nails it and she takes such charge she's so strong you know she's good yeah. christopher Plummer, of course icon uh, foot. <laughs> Sorry. Chris that was, that was Edelweiss uh, Plummer. Uh, no, he's awesome. I bonded with him on Star Trek because we've both been in Star Trek. He played a sort of uh, a Klingon, uh, I think, in the Undiscovered Country. So that's why I went in there. I didn't go for the sound of music. I went for Star Trek. Uh, he's awesome. He's 83, is he? No, he's 84. He's 85 wow. now. Uh, yeah, so I mean, well. just such a kind of professional and lovely. He plays a kind of Californian professor who's this sort of this weird cross between a boffin and a surfer dude who has this kind of, um, you know, this theory about happiness and this way of, of, of analyzing happiness. Um, and 
it was his, wasn't it his idea to have the hoodie and the beanie all that stuff? Yeah, yeah. That? He, yeah. He, he, called me, he called me one day and said, Peter, I, I think I'd like to wear a beanie. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 go on, really. Let's talk about your costume. He said, no, no, I mean it, a, a beanie. I'm going to wear a beanie. And a, so uh, that was entirely him. He's eccentric. He plays the professor of happiness studies who puts him in a test with electrodes attached to his head. It's kind of bizarre, but, but, it, but you give him a lines. It's like giving a lines to God. Do you know what I mean? It comes back at you. You think, oh, that sounds good. That's not, now that I hear it. Yeah. So, you, amidst all the travelling that you did, any mishaps? I know Hector has some mishaps. Did you, as a crew and a cast, get we up to anything? We never didn't have mishaps. <laughs> really? Tell me the best. Well, I think what was so extraordinary was that, and I hate to say this because it's almost like I'm saying be sloppy or don't plan, but every time there was an obstacle or a disaster, we fell upwards. And I, I, I don't know what it is, but... When when I'm making a movie, I'm a, I have to be very positive, you know, because it's so hard. Yeah. But and and if a problem comes my way, there's a there's a valve inside me, the creative valve that works better because in solving it, something weird comes about. You know, it's like it, we we had problems in China with permits, and we were we were asked to leave a certain area in the mountains, and we thought that our film was not complete until we recreated it in Nepal and a bit in Bavaria and Austria, and you look at it, and it's like this snowscape suddenly that we would not have otherwise had, you know. Yeah. So it was all, yes, there were, it, it was amazing how we always fell upwards, you know. I remember being, we were in uh, just outside Johannesburg, we were shooting in that, uh, where you saw that area, and we were, our unit base, which is where all the trailers and the facilities are and the catering, was in a kind of field, and I was in my trailer, and, and, and it was, there was no water, and it was really hot, and I was like, God, oh, this is like really rough in it, this is like, you know, this is what it's like when you're in South Africa and you're making a film. And then I went home to, uh, to London to do a little reshoot on The World's End and I was in Watford, uh, Bushy in Watford, and I was in my trailer, it was really small and there was no water and it was really hot and I thought, no, <laughs> it, it, it's like this everywhere, you know. Um, but yeah, we had some, we had some incredible um, things happen to us on the trip. I think one of the greatest friends of creativity is adversity. You know, when you're forced yeah. to think on your feet, sometimes the worst thing you can do, and this sounds like asking for trouble, is have as much money and time as you want. Because then you'll just fudge everything and you just, you don't really, when, when you're up against yeah. it, you Same are your best. Same with the happiness best. thing that you were yeah, saying about Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. You to have to challenges be, to rise to. Yeah, comfort is an enemy of creativity, yeah, I think. exactly. Before I cut to the audience, I'd like to ask you both quickly about your future projects. Um, Simon first, what have you got going on? Uh, I've just started training for Mission Impossible 5, which I actually will start next Wednesday. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm, I've currently mm -hmm. been fighting men. Fight, I had to fight with three men the other day. Wow. And I, I won. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't training, that was just in the street. Um, but yeah, that Mission 5 and then Star Trek 3, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a little... I've had a really nice run of, of smaller films. Yeah. I, did, I did Hector and then I did a film called Man Up and then Absolutely mm -hmm. Anything. And now I'm going into a, uh, a run of, of big sort of blockbusters, which I love just as much. So, Great you know, stuff. it's uh, a yeah, nice, nice bit of variation. Peter? Yeah, I, I've just started training to be able to go from the bedroom uh, in the morning. No, no. But uh, actually... Uh, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Where are you going with this? I know. I, the, the thing I'm most likely to do next came to me from the same producer, Ju Judy Tossel, who's sitting over there. Um, and it's a Dickens project. It's a beautiful story. And it would probably film here, which makes me happy. It's a fictional story about what ha happened to Charles Dickens uh, just before he wrote um, Christmas Carol. And uh, it's That's my uh, favorite book ever. There you go. A lot of people's favorite. It's a beautiful story. I hope to be sitting here one day talking about that. Fantastic look forward to seeing that uh, so audience I think hands may be coming up for questions please wait for the microphone to come to you um, over here first thank you hi um, what was your favorite place to film it's difficult to answer that really because each place had its own sort of charm and, and, and set of memories it's like we said about making five different films I, I did have a, a real soft spot for South Africa I, I'd, I'd watched that country since I was a kid I remember when I, you know, trying to be political when I was 16 and wearing my anti-apartheid badge and not eating grapes and thinking I was a real kind of like political monster, and then getting there and seeing it and uh, it was extraordinary and, and an education and to see, you know, we we had downtime and we went to a lot of the museums and saw a lot of, you know, the effects of apartheid and how that st is still kind of there in a way. It's not there politically, but it's very much there socially. Um, it was eye-opening and it was an incredible experience to meet people who were, you know, emerging from that 
period, that shameful period of history and, and, and how they're trying to move forward from that. It was, it was educational. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got another question now. Hello. Um, you've been in various genres of like films and you've played various characters. What makes this character different to all those you've played before? I think Hector's interesting in that he's... A lot of the characters I've played before have been like guys who uh, don't want to grow up. You know, Sean doesn't want to grow up and Nick, uh, Gary King certainly doesn't want to grow up. Uh, the, the character in Run Fat Boy Run, Dennis, he doesn't want to grow up. These guys that are just tied to their youth, they just want to be kids forever. Hector stopped being a kid when he was 12, I think. You know, he kind of cut himself off from his childhood self. Um, for whatever reason, he has no access to his his youthful exuberance you know he's just this sort of like robotic adult and part of his journey is to reconnect with this younger part of himself because when we're young we we you know we make our first all our first reactions to the big important things in life sex death love rejection you know abandonment whatever they're all set when you're a kid all those parameters are set when you're a child and you need to remain in touch with those in order to progress as an adult in order to understand how far you've come kind of thing and um I'm not like that personally. I'm very in touch with my childhood self because I try and always, you know, a, a, a sort of approach my life like a kid. Like if I do something like get a part in Star Trek, I try and act like, uh, wow, brilliant, not whatever. You know, I think it's much more healthy to do that. So he's very different in that respect. He's not, he's not Sean, you know, and he's not, he's the opposite. He's the anti-Sean of the dead, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, questions over this side, maybe, if we can pass the mic down. Thank you. Um, have you read the book and what was your favourite part of it? Because when I read it, I like absolutely loved the monk bit. And as I was reading it, I already knew this film was coming out. So I just immediately pictured you. <laughs> Did you do that when you were reading the book? I, uh, I will, I'll let Peter answer the question about his favourite bit because I haven't read the book. And I, I, didn't, I made a conscious decision not to read it when I got the screenplay because I felt like it would be a purer experience for me if I just treated it as a screenplay and not as... If I read the book and then started questioning why certain things hadn't been included or, or missing certain... Because you know, when you adapt a book, stuff's got to go and it's a real shame, but a book isn't a film. A book is a far more expansive, far more kind of layered, imaginative medium because it's all up here, you know, and that's limitless. Film isn't. So you, you, have, to, you have to lose things in adaptation. So I thought I will treat this like a screenplay and I'm going to read it tomorrow. Pete, what's your favourite bit? Can I ask you to raise your hand if you've read the book? So, moving on. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it, so the question was, what was the favorite part of the book? Or yeah, how do we change the book? Um, you haven't seen the film? No, it's very, you, you, the, the, the tone of the book and the flavor of the book is there, without a doubt. There were certain things we changed. I think that the book starts, once upon a time, there was a young psychiatrist called Hector who was not very satisfied with his life. We start the film with, there was a young psychiatrist called Hector who was very satisfied with his life because he's in denial. So we create a first act where he's in denial and he explodes and it's a crisis and that propels him to take the journey. That's a kind of film structure thing. That's a film structure thing. And uh, so there, there are lots of choices we made like that. You remember all those sayings and dictums that come up, lessons in happiness? We made up half of the ones in the film. But, but, yeah, we reflected the tone of the book quite a lot. The Tintin bit of the book, that's there. That's all that. Tintin. Okay, there's a question about that. Hi. Um, did you find the happiness in your life and into the movie at the end? <laughs> uh, I think it kind of helped us, uh, for me anyway, it, it helped me understand what happiness is. I think the, the, the point of it is is that Hector kind of sees it as a grail almost and learns that it isn't a grail at all. It's the search that's the important thing. You know, you, you experience happiness on the way. If life is a journey, it's something you experience on the way. It's not something you ever get to. You can understand it better and you can, you can be more in control of it and, and, and perhaps understand how to access it a bit better. But anyone who is happy all the time is lying, you know, and annoying as well. <laughs> And if someone is parentally happy, you just think something's wrong with you, you know, there's something going on that's not right. Uh, you have to be unhappy. You, what the, the, the most important dictum for me in the film is avoiding unhappiness is not the route to happiness. If you try and just, if you try to be happy all the time, you will fail. 
and you will also perhaps achieve a sort of level of numbness where you're just all right the whole time, you know, and it's not, it's not up or down, it's just this kind of like one note sort of life of comfort. Things that we are led to believe are happiness, entertainment, comfort, you know, um, things that taste nice, that's not happiness. Th th you can enjoy stuff if you're happy. You can enjoy all those things if you're happy, but you have to be happy somewhere else in order to enjoy it. You can be, I mean, Jesus Christ, you know, Robin Williams this week was such a terrible shock and such a terrible loss. And I, but I hope it makes people understand that you can be as, as popular, as wealthy, as famous, as, as the most famous, popular, wealthy person in the world and still not be happy. If there's something fundamentally wrong in your happiness, it, none of that means a damn thing, you know. People mistake all that all the time. They see, they see you know, people on television, they go, oh, I want, to be, I want to be like that. I want to be like that pop star because that's happiness. And it really isn't, you know. You have to be able to enjoy that to be happy, I think. I think one of the points that the film makes, and it's at, at the very end, so I'll spoil the film for you, um, is where Simon's character comes to the conclusion that we actually, all of us, have an obligation to be happy. Now, what, be careful by what that means, you know. I make it very, very clear in the movie, there's a character, one of his patients early on, who's clearly bipolar, and he says, my patients think they're hopeless, that's hopeless. So no one is saying to those kinds of people, cheer up. By obligation to be happy, it's almost like a responsibility. It's what the Dalai Lama calls a responsibility to be happy. And that's one of the messages. Yes, the film changed me in the process of making it. I found that I came out of it very grateful and glad to be who I am and where I am. Yes. Thank you. Great answers there. Um, can I have a question over here, please? Thank you. I actually have two questions. One is why wasn't Paul the third in the Cornetto trilogy? And two, why is it called the Cornetto trilogy? Uh, Paul isn't wasn't written by Edgar Wright. Uh, the, the 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 Cornetto trilogy is uh, a series of films that were written by myself and Edgar Wright and directed by Edgar and starring me. Uh, Edgar had nothing to do with Paul. That was me and Nick Frost that wrote that, and it was directed by Greg Matola. Also, the Cornetto films are specifically about loss of identity uh, in the midst of uh, a huge kind of collective force. So Sean versus the zombies, Nicholas Angel versus the NWA, Gary and his friends versus the network. And they're all about living in the UK. And they're all about uh, a variety of things. And they're linked by the Cornetto ice cream, which we put in because we got free ice cream at the premiere of Shaun of the Dead. And we thought, why do we put it in Hot Fuzz? We might get more free ice cream. And then it became the thing, that, oh, that's what links them. And actually, the Cornettos are irrelevant, really. What links them are the fact that they're set in the present day. They're set in the UK. They're kind of about Britishness to an extent. And also that thing I just said. And um, they're also um, films that I think take a, what might be un understood as a, a, a sort of grander American genre. I disagree with that on, in terms of The World's End, because I think that's a sort of social science fiction which, very, which is very British. But they do tackle generic ideas, the zombie film, the horror film, the science fiction film. That was the answer to both those questions. <laughs> Excellent <laughs> answers. You've done that before, haven't you? Uh, right towards the back there we have, actually. Thank you. Um, do you think that there are any similarities and or differences between you and the character that you play? Uh, no, I think I, f I feel like I am more, uh, and I think this is a big one for you as well as the director, as someone who created the character. I, f I feel that Hector is, I'm far more mature than Hector, I think, in that I'm more in control or I'm more aware of my emotions. I understand myself a little better than Hector does, I think. Uh, we look alike, I'll give you that. Um, <laughs> I, he's, he, his suits are quite nice. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's, it was good. To, it was fun to play Hector because it was a stretch for me. It wasn't me, you know. There's more of me and the other characters I've played in the past. This was like I had to go to him and discover who he was. And I didn't, he, I didn't like him at first, really. I, I, when you first meet him, he's a bit like cold, you know. But it was nice to have a journey to go on because it, it's always good when a character has an arc, and Hector really does. What about you? Is anything? Well, you've already said you're packing. Uh, technique. No, no, no. I, I think that um, casting it was, to use a phrase of the week, daunting. B because, because on the one hand, he's a psychiatrist and he's very intelligent, very wise, very educated. And on the other hand, he's an idiot. And he's a really nerdy British traveler, you know, with a whistle for emergencies. I mean, literally. So to get that right, uh, uh, it, that was daunting. But when when, when the idea of Simon happened, you know, I thought the thing about Simon is he has such an innate childlike curiosity about everything he does. 
Simon looks at things as if he's seeing them for the first time. Some people call that good acting. I call it good acting. But it's like he just has that Tintin-esque, naive quality that you could send him around the world and people in his wake will be positively affected in some way. So does that answer your question? Because Simonness is, to me anyway, he may, might not say very close to Hectorness, very, very close. And once we cast Simon, I said, okay, everyone, from here on, there's going to be a very fine line between around the world with Simon Pegg and Hector and the Search for Happiness. <laughs> and, I, and I actually wanted to make sure I cast him and then celebrated those qualities of Simon. And I think it makes for, if I may say, a very warm and charming performance, Simon. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's what it I It does, hear, hear. Uh, time for one or two more questions. Perhaps some further towards the back here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for passing the mic down. Do you have a role that you prefer to play? So you obviously play a kind of the p person that you're portraying is different in all the kind of films that you do. Is there one in particular that you kind of really enjoyed playing or...? It's always good to play somebody who is imperfect, and that's generally everyone you play, it should be, you know. It's always nice to play somebody with a big stumbling block to becoming who they should be or, you know, the, the bigger the fault sometimes, the, the more interesting it is. Um, and Hector, you know, was, was a perfect example of that for someone who was kind of emotionally uh, squeamish and, and stunted, you know. And similarly, Gary King in The World's End, someone who was a kind of, you know, a suicidal alcoholic, which you don't really discover until the end of the movie. Th playing that kind of stuff is nice because you have to, before, before the audience fully realize it, you have to give them every opportunity to guess who they are, you know, by just showing what's going on under the surface. And, and, and that's a hard thing to do sometimes because, um, you know, you're basically having to communicate something without saying it and, and also not being too obvious. But that's a great challenge as an actor, you know. It's nice to, to have stuff. You see it in, at the beginning in Hector when, when he's watching Rosamund, she makes a speech at her work do and she's talking about, you know, this, this drug that they've come up with a name for. And you can see that he's not entirely, doesn't quite respect her job in a way and you can also see that when the, her boss talks about the fact she's never taken maternity leave that it stings him a little bit but you can't go oh i don't like that you know because that's just too much you have to show it very very gently under the surface and that stuff is fun to play you did that on take one two and three and then i stopped you did you <laughs> oh, God. oh that's my natural instinct my my motto is never knowingly underplayed and uh peter put that snip that in the bud <laughs> That's not true. He's a fearless actor. He, his, his, I'm going to say this. Please go see the film for his performance. It is like you've never seen Simon Pegg. A, he's a fearless actor. Incredibly straight as well as very, very funny. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable performance. Well, see, that seems like a good note to end on, I think. Um, all go and see the film. It is lots of fun. Thank you all so much for taking part. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Simon and Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.